Oval Office meeting. America's top political leaders come together to discuss the president's multi-trillion dollar proposals. Religious Freedom Report. The State Department identifies the biggest threats across the globe. House shakeup. Republicans oust Liz Cheney after she sided against President Donald Trump. And more signs of fighting. Rockets fill the skies over the Holy Land as the number of victims on the ground grows. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, May 12th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Joe Biden meets with top congressional leaders in the Oval Office. He is pushing his controversial and massive infrastructure spending plan. The president says that he is seeking consensus on a compromise. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. It's the definition of infrastructure that has Republicans saying, hold on, a multi-trillion dollar price tag and proposed tax hikes to pay for it. In the Oval Office and wearing their masks, President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris sit down with Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and House Republican Leader Kevin McCarthy. When I ran, I said I wasn't going to be a Democratic president. I was going to be a president for all Americans. The president said he wanted to talk a lot about infrastructure, and Press Secretary Jen Psaki said there could be other areas of agreement. There are a range of issues that there has historically been bipartisan cooperation on, including issues like immigration. Well, we had a good hour and a half meeting. Later, speaking outside the West Wing, Senator Mitch McConnell said there's a bipartisan desire to get an outcome, but added... Clearly, uh, Senate Republicans are not interested in revisiting the 2017 tax bill. Meanwhile, fallout from the Colonial Pipeline cyber attack, panic buying. This is a line to get gas. 1,000 gas stations running out of fuel. Also in the press briefing room today, the Secretary of Transportation admits. We know that the cyber attack on the Colonial Pipeline is affecting fuel supply for some Americans. States in the southeast are more reliant on the pipeline for fuel. This incident also reminds us that infrastructure is a national security issue. According to GasBuddy.com, in North Carolina, 28 percent of gas stations out of fuel. The folks should follow the advice of the governors and the attorney generals, which they're asking um, folks not to panic, not to hoard gasoline. Meanwhile, new worries over inflation. The government reported that consumer prices for goods and services surged in April. And by the way, that surge in consumer prices was the largest monthly jump in more than a decade. People are paying more for things like food, clothes, homes, and cars. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Our U.S. House Republicans have voted out Wyoming Congressman Liz Cheney as the chair of the party's conference. Well, Liz Cheney's responsibility is to lead our conference in the House of Representatives. And so she has a particular responsibility as a result of that. Um, and it... it, it, it Frankly, it doesn't serve us well if she's creating fomenting division in our ranks. In reaction, Congresswoman Cheney pledges commitment to conservative principles, but emphatic opposition to former President Trump. Joining us now is Dennis Ross, former Republican congressman from Florida and current director of the American Center for Political Leadership at Southeastern University. Representative Ross, thank you so much for your time today. Great to have you on. Uh, first off, your thoughts you. on Liz Cheney's ouster as chair of the GOP conference. Are you at all surprised? And what do you think that says about the state of the Republican Party? Well, it doesn't surprise me that, that she was ousted. Uh, look, when you're in a leadership role and you're trying to get people to follow you as a cohesive group, uh, you've got to you've got to nurture that. And the fact that the majority, uh, the minority leader, and the and the whip were not in concert with with Liz Cheney did not do well. So they have the the option, and they exercised it today to oust her to move on. She also has the right to her opinion. There's no dis there's there's no problem with that. The issue that we have right now, though, that we have to be concerned with as Republicans, is that this needs to be put behind us now. There is an opportunity, a tremendous opportunity, to to win the House back in 2022. You cannot have division. You cannot have dysfunction. And so if, you, if you're if you going to handle it, handle it now. 
Now, what's going to happen in 2022, we don't know. But, it, it, you know, I was there for eight years. We had the majority. We had 237 Republican members. All we needed was 218 to pass a law, and we couldn't get anything done. We couldn't repeal health care. We couldn't do immigration. We couldn't do guest worker. The only thing we ever got done was the major sweeping tax reform, which was done under the direction and leadership of uh, President Trump. So the Republicans have got to come together after this. Uh, I understand after that closed door vote uh, that Representative Cheney spoke and she said the nation uh, needs a strong Republican Party. Uh, she also said that she would do everything to ensure that former President Trump doesn't get anywhere near the Oval Office again. Uh, but back in February at CPAC, President Trump actually won the 2024 presidential straw poll. Can you unpack that for us? You know, what does that signal regarding Donald Trump's position in the GOP? Well, it's very strong. And you will see, especially in this election in 2022, in the primaries, I think you'll see Donald Trump playing and uh, endorsing some uh, anti-Trump Republicans, against anti-Trump Republicans. And, and, and I think you'll see that, that right now he's carrying a strong momentum with him. And, and, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that Biden said, when, when I am elected president, I will bring together this country and we will be a bipartisan uh, leadership. That has not happened. Uh, the American people are also seeing, uh, you know, the economy starting to, to decline. We're seeing unemployment, even when there's opportunities n not to recover. So I think they're looking forward to having somebody that at least said they would do what, do what they said they would do, and that was Donald Trump. H how do we unpack this? Look, I don't think that uh, Donald Trump is probably going to run for president again. But that doesn't mean that since he won't be king, he won't be a kingmaker. All right. And before I let you go, who's considered to be the front runner right now when it comes to the next GOP chair? And where do you see the future of the GOP? Well, with regard to uh, the conference chair in the House, I think that Elise Stefanik uh, is most likely going to be the odds-on favorite, mainly because she has the support of Whip Scalise and, and Leader McCarthy. She's also been out there out front, uh, even though it's interesting her voting record is a lot more liberal than what Liz Cheney's was. Um, so so I, I would imagine that, that Elise would, would probably be the one who... But then again, I think she's got some aspirations well beyond this, maybe in New York in, in a gubernatorial race. Um, but my, the, the important thing I'm trying to press upon is the Republicans need to be cohesive. They can't be holier than thou and hold somebody back because you're not as, as conservative as we want you to be. The Republicans have always had a problem being able to coalesce behind one idea and get it accomplished. Now is their golden opportunity to not only coalesce on an agenda, but also to take back the House and hopefully the Senate. Dennis Ross, former Republican congressman from Florida and director of the American Center for Political Leadership at Southeastern University. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, India continues to suffer from increasing coronavirus infections and deaths. An estimated 370,000 cases have been reported over the past 24 hours. Health officials fear the onset of a potentially aggressive COVID-19 variant. The single-day death toll has now surpassed 4,000, with respectful care of remains adding to the anguish. Well, the death toll from Israeli airstrikes on Gaza has climbed to at least 43, including women and children. Nearly 300 Palestinians in the Gaza territory were wounded in the strikes, and ambulances raced to bring people to the hospital. The situation has been tense for days. This is the worst fight since the 2014 Gaza war. Joining us now is Father Peter Vacari, president of the Catholic Near East Welfare Association. Father, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, tell us, what is the Catholic Church's position in the Israel-Palestine conflict? Yeah, thank you very much, Tracy, for the opportunity to speak. Um, the Catholic Church, of course, is very concerned with the eruption of violence recently in East Jerusalem in particular. Kinewa, we ourselves, have a basic gospel mandate and a papal character. Uh, insofar as we were founded by Pope Pius XI in 1926. As we look to confl conflicts like this, uh, we try to articulate and to present the position of the Catholic Church, that is, to work for justice. If there is going to be peace, there must be justice. In Jerusalem, of course, under the circumstances that we find ourselves, it is a matter of the recognition that in Jerusalem, this is where the origins of the Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, 
Christianity and Islam. This is where they have had such deep roots. And therefore, at this time, it is a matter of respecting the right of each religion to be able to gather in prayer and in worship. Father, what can you tell us about uh, the local religious leaders over there in the Middle East? Uh, wh what are they saying? On Sunday and on Monday, state two statements were issued. One statement was issued by His Beatitude, Archbishop Pizzabala, representing the Latin Patriarchate in Jerusalem. The other statement that was issued was issued by, again, His Beatitude, Archbishop Pizzabala, but together with the Orthodox and even the Protestant leaders and the um, Franciscan Custos. Uh, and what they all had in common was a call for the end to the violence, recognition of that which has been granted by international law, by UN resolutions, and by the status quo, namely, the right of each of the three religions to be able to worship and to be able to recognize Jerusalem for, the, for what it is as the city that has such deep roots for the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and the recognition on the part of each for the other to be able to worship in that holy city. Again, we pray, as the psalm says, for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122. Oh, Father, thank you so much for your time today and for what you do. We really do appreciate it. Father Peter Vicari, president of the Catholic Near East Welfare Association, thank you again. Pope Francis met today with Germany's foreign minister, the Holy Father, and Heiko Maas had the meeting inside of the Vatican. The two exchanged gifts. Pope Francis received a piece of the Berlin Wall. The foreign minister received a depiction of Christ. A list of topics they discussed was not made public. Coming up, State Department report where Christians and other religious minorities are facing extreme persecution. Our Secretary of State Antony Blinken is affirming the U.S. commitment to religious freedom around the world. The Biden-Harris administration will protect and defend religious freedom around the world. We will maintain America's long-standing leadership on this issue. We're grateful to our partners. The Secretary of State addressed the 2020 International Religious Freedom Report, which the department reports by law to Congress. The report cites instances of oppression and persecution, naming the governments of Iran, Myanmar, also known as Burma, Russia, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, and China. Joining us now from Iraq is Jeremy Barker, director of the Middle East Action Team at the Religious Freedom Institute. Jeremy, welcome back. Good to be with you. Uh, as we just heard, the Secretary of State says that President Biden will continue to defend religious liberty around the world. From your viewpoint, um, how is the administration doing so far? Yeah, well, um, today today was a good moment for this um, to hear the administration reassert their commitment and for Secretary Blinken um, to highlight that that they really do view religious freedom as a, a fundamental right, a universal right, as he said. Um, this goes to the, really to the heart of what it means to be human, to think freely, to follow our conscience, um, to express our religion. So um, today was um, on the international scene for international religious freedom. It was encouraging to hear um, really a strong statement from Secretary Blinken today. Jeremy, can you talk a little bit more about the report, maybe some of the key takeaways? Yeah, so this is the 23rd report now that the State Department has produced, and it covers the situation of religious freedom in almost 200 countries around the world. Um, this is the fifth administration that's done it, and, um, and it really is um, a kind of the gold standard for a government-produced report in, in assessing what's going on. Um, and they do point, um, unfortunately, to some worrying trends that we're looking at around the world. Uh, one of those is certainly um, repressive government restrictions um, that are criminalizing religious exercise. Um, sometimes this shows up in blasphemy laws like we continue to see in Pakistan or in Egypt. Um, we've also seen uh, regulation on religious life that leads to shutting down of churches. This has been amplified by the, the um, 
COVID-19 pandemic in places like Algeria, where churches remain um, closed, but you have other houses of worship that have been opened. Um, we also see religious discrimination and hate crimes that are rising, um, whether this is anti-Semitism or anti-Muslim, anti-Christian rhetoric. Um, that continues to be something that often is fueled, fueled with nationalist um, tendencies. And unfortunately, this often leads to uh, really religious freedom violations are kind of an early warning of mass atrocities. And we look at um, what's happened here in the Middle East over the last number of years or in uh, Burma, as you mentioned, with the Rohingya Muslim and other minority communities, or even in China, where you have uh, continued religious repression that now has, has really reached a level of genocide. And so those are some of the key themes that stood out in this year's report. What about countries that are considered the most dangerous for Christians? And also, were there any countries on that list that maybe improve when it comes to religious freedom? Yeah, so um, there are a number of places that we're, we are really concerned about. Um, as I just mentioned, Burma is, is in an extremely... A uh, worrying place right now where you have a, a military coup, but this comes on the back of, of um, really what appears to be genocide ag committed against Rohingya Muslims, but also its uh, Christian community is, has faced similar attacks. And so that's one we're watching closely. Um, China um, is another one that's that is very concerning, and it's not not only what's happened to to the Uyghur Muslim community, but their China's Christian communities continue to face very severe restrictions. Then another place that um, continues to need even more attention is is really across sub-Saharan Africa, um, places like Ethiopia and Nigeria. There are huge religious freedom challenges and violence continues to escalate. So that's somewhere where we, we really need to be paying greater attention to. Um, and, and this ought to be a particular concern for Christians um, as they think about uh, fellow Christians around the world, but it's something that affects uh, people of all faiths. Well, Jeremy, unfortunately, we have to leave it right there. But thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Jeremy Barker, director of the Middle East Action Team at the Religious Freedom Institute. Up next, Catholic school setback. The problems facing parochial schools across the country. And persistent prayer. The Holy Father's message to the faithful gathered outdoors. A recent story in the Wall Street Journal says Catholic schools are losing students at record rates and hundreds are closing. Signing numbers from the National Catholic Educational Association, the journal reports more than 200 of the country's nearly 6,000 Catholic schools have closed. At enrollment nationwide fell 6.4 percent at the start of the school year. That is the largest single year decline since at least the 1970s. Joining us now is Patrick Riley, president and founder of the Cardinal Newman Society. Patrick, welcome back. Great to have you on. Um, we're going to take a Thank look you. at those numbers in just a second. But first, I want to I want to get your initial reaction to that report. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, obviously, it's tragic. I mean, every Catholic child deserves a Catholic education. And uh, this is a real loss for a lot of families. Um, I do think it needs to be put into context. Um, the, uh, since 1965, on average, 109 schools have closed every single year. So we've had a six decade problem in Catholic education and COVID packed a punch, but we need to be dealing with some of the bigger problems by strengthening Catholic identity and by bringing costs down so that more Catholic families can come back to Catholic education. Yeah, and I want to go back to those numbers again. Uh, as we mentioned, more than 200 Catholic schools have closed. And as the Wall Street Journal reports, uh, more may even close over the summer. Does that surprise you? I know in some areas, Catholic schools actually saw a boost in enrollment this year, particularly because of COVID, because public schools were closed. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, we did see a, a nice big boost in enrollment, but that was after a big initial decline. And so you're, you're seeing some net negative numbers even with that boost. Um, a very large portion, I think I saw at the NCEA, uh, they said that about 40% of the enrollment decline was in pre-K, these pre-kindergarten students 
So, you know, you got a lot of parents who are staying home to work and struggling with the bills. And so I have a lot of hope that this is simply a temporary problem for a lot of the, the families and that uh, many of these students will come back. Yeah, and I should say public schools were closed for in-person learning, doing online instead. Uh, I know for a lot of people this Wall Street Journal report sounds rather dismal, but there are a lot of wonderful things happening uh, for Catholic schools across the country. Can you talk about that and why Catholic schools, I know you touched on it before, but why they're so important to children and families? Yeah, we're hearing from a number of Catholic schools that are actually doing very, very well. And I can tell you on the higher education end, uh, many of these good, strong, faithful Catholic colleges are bursting at the seams with their enrollment, and their enrollment numbers for next year are looking very, very good. So, um, you know, part of it is is providing something that Catholic families really want. And it's many of the schools that are closing are are sort of weak in their Catholic identity. They tend to be the inner city schools that are focused on larger numbers of non-Catholic students. Um, the homeschooling numbers, the Census Bureau just came out with a report saying that 11 percent of American families with children homeschooled in 2020. And so if that holds up for Catholic families, it may be that even though Catholic schools have declined, Catholic education in a broader sense has not. And uh, our, the church needs to be focused much more on promoting and embracing these things, homeschooling, independent Catholic, you know, lay run Catholic schools, um, hybrid programs, all of these different options that tend to be lower in cost and also very strong in their Catholic identity. And Patrick, we probably have about a minute or so left, but wondering, do you have any final thoughts or, or um, any advice that you can give maybe to our viewers when it comes to Catholic schools and, and helping them? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I, obviously we need to help Catholic schools in terms of, of their costs. Um, it's, it's just expensive. Catholic schools tend to actually be lower cost than other private schools. But um, we are also doing a lot to try to help out a lot of people who, who need the help to be able to afford those schools. And so um, helping them financially is very important. But ultimately, the future of Catholic education is in the strengthening of their Catholic identities. So to the extent that um, especially young people can uh, go into the field of education and bring their strong faith and culture into our Catholic schools, that will be the hope for the future. Uh, and certainly, you know, embracing these other opportunities like homeschooling and hybrid schools. And uh, Catholic education is becoming a much broader thing than just the parochial school. Uh, and Patrick, thank you for your time today and speaking with us. We appreciate it. Patrick Riley, president and founder of the Cardinal Newman Society. Thanks again. Thank you. And finally tonight, Pope Francis reminds the faithful that prayer can lead to miracles. La preghiera fa dei miracoli, perché la preghiera va proprio al centro della tenerezza di Dio. At his weekly talk to pilgrims at the Vatican, the Holy Father says persistent prayer goes directly to the heart of God and can lead to remarkable accomplishments. The meeting with the faithful was held outdoors for the first time in six months. Oh, we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. We leave you tonight with more images from the Holy Father's weekly talk at the Vatican. Good night and God bless.